The repercussions of the SL-1 explosion lasted well past 9.01 p.m. on January 3, 1961. And although most people no longer remember the accident, it touched hundreds of lives and rippled down through generations. Dick Legg died before he could see the birth of his son. Jack Burns and Richard McKinley both had young children who would never know their fathers. The men's wives not only had to put their lives back together, but also deal with nasty rumors of love triangles and murder-suicides. The rescuers lived with the horror of what they'd seen, and some of them no doubt worried about what effect all that radiation exposure would have. SL-1 left a permanent mark on their lives and on the nuclear industry as a whole. For the Army, the accident was the handwriting on the wall. It was basically the beginning of the end. Like they, they didn't say, okay, SL-1 blew up, so we're shutting down the program, but it went into like this general perception that it was not cost-effective or, or practical. SL-1 became a case study in what not to do. In the aftermath of the accident, investigators and officials wrote report after report about what went wrong, trying to glean valuable information from the tragedy. There are a lot of lessons learned from that accident that are incorporated into reactor designs. And in fact, all of our reactor designs in operation, given how early in, the, in our nuclear, nuclear power history that accident was. So making sure the inverted removal of one control rod can't lead to that type of accident. This didn't have to happen. I'm not just talking about the shoddy maintenance and the inexperienced operators. No, the biggest issue was always the fundamental problem of the five control rods. Engineers designed the reactor that way to make it lighter and simpler to operate. It was a trade-off, but one with a serious and deadly flaw. And the design flaw was that out of all of the control rods in the, the core, the central control rod in the center, if that were removed, you could go critical, go to power. And they, they knew that. The Army knew that. But they kept operating. They knew it, and they still designed it that way. And they kept operating, even when it became abundantly clear that SL-1 had big problems. They put people in harm's way, both inside the reactor and out. Why? In the name of progress, science, technology? Because it was the path of least resistance? Because it's just how they did things? Were they so enthralled with nuclear energy's potential that they were blinded to its flaws? And as we consider our future and all the possibilities and drawbacks of nuclear power, is this something we risk repeating? What do we stand to gain from this technology? And are the costs worth it? I'm Laura Krantz, and this is Wild Thing, Going Nuclear a series about the power of the universe, contained in the tiny little package of the atom. You and I are living in the atomic age. The endless debate over harnessing that power. The mysteries of the universe. And whether we humans are responsible enough to mess with it. Of benefit or of destruction. Of good or of evil. Hindsight, I've been told, is twenty twenty. At the time, that central control rod may not have seemed so dangerous. The operators themselves didn't seem to be aware of its power and may not have known that it could cause a meltdown. And then, on top of the poor design, add in all the other little errors, like the bad choices in materials that caused the rods to swell and get stuck, so that the men had to use brute force to get them out. And the poor maintenance on the reactor, even after multiple complaints— this choice to move forward in the face of known problems put lives in danger. It's something we see again at Chernobyl, which also had serious design flaws that officials disregarded, and Fukushima, where the nuclear industry sidelined reports that highlighted the dangers of a tsunami. And after every incident like this, we say, well, now we know better. Look what we've learned. We'll never make that mistake again. And we probably won't. But that pattern implies that there's a good chance we make other ones which I think is part of the reason that so many of the people I spoke to seem nervous about a nuclear future. Will we always be reacting to events rather than anticipating them? You know, for better or worse, we do things until something bad happens. And then we have that hindsight to go, oh man, here's how we should have done it. And that's what this was. The fact that we see potential problems and still decide to move ahead raises some red flags. Take New Scale, for instance, that small modular reactor we learned about in the last episode, the one shaped sort of like a soda can and that comes in packs. 
The Nuclear Regulatory Commission noted some safety concerns, but officials still signed off on the design, although NuScale will have more regulatory hoops to jump through. And remember, this is a model that NuScale plans to mass produce on an assembly line, with identical reactors potentially scattered all over the world. So are those little problems a big deal? Could they become one? Are they the kind of thing that might be an issue later on down the road? A problem that we'd look back on and say, oh yeah, we noticed that, but chose to move ahead anyway. Or do we trust that we are better at this than we used to be, and that those problems don't actually pose a significant risk? In the decades following World War II, we held on to our dreams of an atomic future, but they didn't last. Since the 1970s, we've used less and less nuclear power every year. Accidents and fear tarnish its reputation, and the cost, the waste, the health concerns have all chipped away at Americans' confidence in nuclear energy. We've turned to other sources, cheap natural gas, wind, and solar. And given all that, even former nuclear enthusiasts like Todd Tucker, who worked with reactors in the Navy, have trouble seeing a future for nuclear energy. I think it's time has passed. I think like when you create kind of beautiful, elegant technology, like it's hard to say goodbye, right? And I guess that's part of like, I, you know, I spent a significant part of my life like learning how to operate nuclear reactors. So like, I thought it was cool. I thought it'd be a shame like if we stopped using them. I just think that the total cost of ownership of nuclear plants is so high when you wrap up like the risk and the regulatory concerns and then the waste disposal. And so as the price plummets with fracking and natural gas, it's just like no business entity would ever consider it. And yet the nuclear industry is proposing all kinds of new reactor designs. We've already heard about NuScale's small modular reactor. There's also Marvel, a micro-reactor, which can be up to a thousand times smaller than the conventional reactors we use today. These micro-reactors could help power remote communities or serve as backup generators for power plants and disaster relief. TerraPower, a nuclear energy company founded by Bill Gates, announced in 2021 that it would replace a coal-fired power plant in Wyoming with a nuclear one. And that's just some of what's happening in the United States. Overseas, companies like Rolls-Royce are developing their own small modular reactors for use in the United Kingdom. And the French are building new reactors for the first time in decades. Since I started working on this podcast, I'm not sure a week has gone by without my mom sending me a news article about yet another new reactor concept. Thanks, Mom. Molten salt reactors, fast reactors, lead-cooled reactors... Scientists and engineers are developing all kinds of different technologies that nuclear enthusiasts claim will be more efficient, reduce risks, and produce less waste. So perhaps there is still hope for an atomic future after all. But what changed? We have global warming to deal with, meaning we need to switch away from carbon-based sources of energy. Historian Richard Rhodes, who we heard from earlier in this series, says that even in the early days, people touted nuclear power as a clean energy source. In fact, in 1957, to sell Pittsburgh on the idea of America's first civilian nuclear power plant, officials heralded it as an environmental project. I interviewed the head of the Duquesne Power and Light Company, and he said, you know, the city of Pittsburgh was worse than today's Beijing in terms of air pollution because of all the coal burning to make steel. So he said, we sold this to the city council of Pittsburgh because it would help clean up the air. So, so the very first commercial reactor in the United States was considered the latest in green technology. That changed in the 1960s and 70s, especially in the wake of Three Mile Island. Environmentalists turned against nuclear energy, and most of them maintained that position until fairly recently. Climate change, though, has altered the landscape. Promoters of, of nuclear today argue that every energy regime is accompanied by risks. And if you weigh the risks of nuclear against the risks of ever escalating rates of carbon emissions, there's really no comparison. And, says historian Natasha Zaretsky, this time a lot of environmentalists are on board. So Stuart Brand, who's an example of a very famous environmentalist who cut his teeth on anti-nuclear activism back in the 70s and is now a very well-known pro-nuclear environmentalist, his 
famous argument is that the more you learn about climate change and carbon emissions, the more frightened you get. And with nuclear, it's the opposite. The more you learn about nuclear, the less afraid you get. Yes, nuclear energy poses long-term risks. We certainly have to think about things like potential accidents, the storage of nuclear waste, and what those mean for future generations. But climate change has its own laundry list of problems. By continuing to rely on fossil fuels, we can expect more frequent and intense droughts and storms, rising sea levels, melting glaciers, and warming oceans, all of which pose a growing threat to our economy and our communities, both now and for generations to come. Advocates say nuclear energy is a way to potentially avert that bleak future. That's certainly on the mind of John Radford, who sits on the city council in Idaho Falls. We have to realize that the extreme weather events in the West, and particularly for us here in Idaho Falls, the fire season, it comes from climate change. And um, if we want a higher quality of life for our breathing, for our outdoor recreation, then we all need to be concerned about climate change. Now, Idaho Falls gets almost all of its power from hydroelectric, as well as from solar and wind. But more people are moving to Idaho. Demands for energy are going up. And John doesn't want Idaho Falls to use fossil fuels if it doesn't have to. I think we have a bigger responsibility to um, sequester carbon through trees, plant life in our city, but also just ensuring that uh, we get away from gas-powered vehicles and dump trucks and And so we need the flexibility to be able to have on-demand power. So when our river is running low and we aren't producing as many megawatts of power from our turbine, it would be very nice to be able to turn to the nuclear power of a small modular reactor. Not everyone in Idaho Falls is as enthusiastic about nuclear energy as John, or even thinks it can solve climate change. Tammy Thatcher lives on the outskirts of Idaho Falls and has extremely strong opinions about anything and everything nuclear. Climate change is very frightening. It's very real. But if you have enough nuclear to make a difference to climate change, you'll be ruining not just one generation of lives. You're wiping, you're wiping out humanity. Tammy used to work at the Idaho National Laboratory doing risk assessment for nuclear reactors. She doesn't anymore. She left years ago. But she still keeps an eye on what's going on out there at the site. And it's fair to say that she's extremely anti-nuclear. In fact, she'll tell you that herself. I'm anti-nuclear because I, I believe people should have the chance to be healthy. Health is probably Tammy's biggest concern. She says that both her grandmother and great-grandmother died of cancers that she thinks could be related to radiation exposure from the National Reactor Testing Station. As we learned in earlier episodes, this can be a hard case to make. But Tammy sees nuclear energy as a tremendous threat to human health and safety. Plus, you're, you're promising either your looming catastrophe and or the economic, debilitating economic burden of trying to confine the spent fuel, trying to find a solution to confine it for tens of hundreds of thousands of years. Is that a solution? We have to kill the planet to save the planet? I don't know that I agree with all of Tammy's claims, and I certainly see the effects of climate change, like air pollution and the human and economic toll of natural disasters, to be equally, if not more, threatening. But Tammy gives voice to many of the fears, rational or not, that people have with nuclear power. She also makes the argument that nuclear energy is not, in fact, the answer for climate change. You know, it's not a solution. It's and it it detracts from the real work of finding solutions, better energy sources. In other words, the money and time spent on developing nuclear power are resources that could perhaps be better spent on other solutions. It's something I heard from a few other people as well, and it's a point worth considering. Because despite this nuclear renaissance, all of the reactors I mentioned above are still only in the testing phases. They will require a lot more money and a lot more time. Assuming all goes according to plan, and that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission signs off on everything, the new scale reactor won't start producing power until 2030. And it will only be doing this from one location, Idaho. 
The company will then have to get a lot of other reactors up and running, a process that's neither cheap nor fast. Other reactor prototypes will take just as long to start producing energy and then have to scale up, jumping through all the hurdles and bureaucratic red tape. So it's fair to raise the question of whether this actually is the best way forward. We have a long way to go before nuclear energy can replace fossil fuels in this country. But nuclear advocates argue that it doesn't have to be that way. The thing you have to keep in mind is that the people making that argument are also doing everything in their power to make nuclear as costly and difficult to build as possible. Ted Nordhaus again. We heard from him in the last episode. He's the founder of the Breakthrough Institute, a think tank that focuses on technological solutions to environmental problems. The people who almost always say that, if you then ask them about risk, about reform at the NRC so that we could actually build these things faster and cheaper. Oppose all of it. I'll be the first to admit that reducing regulation seems like a bad idea. Given what's happened in the past when we've moved fast, it doesn't necessarily seem like the right answer. But Ted points out that of all the industries out there, nuclear energy is the only industry regulated to the point of zero risk. It costs so much because we literally have practically zero tolerance for health risks associated with radiation exposure. Although, as he points out, that's specific to radiation exposure from electricity generation. We're perfectly happy to get all kinds of medical procedures that involve radiation. As soon as you start doing it for medical uses or any number of other uh, industrial uses, all of that flies out the window and we're willing to tolerate lots of risk. He's not suggesting we get rid of regulation entirely, and he's certainly not pushing for a return to the early days of nuclear energy. I mean, 1961 was kind of the Wild West of the Cold War, and it just was sort of like whatever it took to get the uranium out of the ground, to get it processed, to get it into bombs, to get it into breeder reactors. And so, no, obviously, like 1961 is not the model for what we need. He sees a middle ground between no regulation and too much. And if we're really concerned about climate change, then we need to reconsider our risk tolerance around nuclear energy. We certainly have with other industries. Refineries explode, mines collapse, dams collapse. All sorts of like bad things happen. And we should should try to avoid um, within reason those bad things happening in a way that also recognizes that often... Those things are associated with sort of critical activities that we need to sort of live something that looks like the kind of modern life that you and I take for granted. Sometimes accidents will happen, and there's no way we can predict everything that might go wrong. As with anything, we can take precautions, but not to the point of avoiding all risk. This season of Wild Thing is supported solely by First Light Capital Group. Founded by female entrepreneur Alba Toll, First Light Capital Group is an innovative investment firm that strives to generate outstanding financial returns and change how the industry fosters talent and diversity. First Light has a dual-pronged mission. First, it trades public equities, private equities, and debt using its proprietary data-informed investment process. And second, through a separate seed fund, it seeks to cultivate the next generation of female entrepreneurs by providing women-led businesses in the technology and biotechnology sectors with the capital, infrastructure support, and mentorship needed to take their companies to the next level. To learn more about First Light Capital Group, please visit firstlightcapitalgroup.com. Rather than trying to figure out who's right, those who are enthusiastically pro-nuclear or those who are vehemently against it, John Mecklen suggests looking at it from a different perspective. You have to deal with the world the way it is. John is the editor-in-chief of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, a magazine founded in 1945 right after World War II, when a group of scientists and engineers from the Manhattan Project, including the likes of Albert Einstein, wanted to ensure that the public would be educated about nuclear science. It still exists now, 75 some years later, and now we cover not just nuclear weapons and nuclear power, but all technological threats to the continuation of civilization. John is, first and foremost, a journalist, and he wants to be clear that the opinions he's sharing are his own, not the magazines. The bulletin 
doesn't take positions on just about anything. We're truly a a public interest sort of consumer magazine that puts all sorts of views out there to educate the public about the most important issues around. He doesn't claim to be an expert in nuclear energy, but he has talked to those experts on both sides of the debate and has been doing so for much longer than I have. So we have had experts from all directions dealing with nuclear power, and there simply is no agreement at the expert level on whether nuclear power should or should not be a major factor in dealing with climate change. Critics say it's not feasible, too costly, too risky. Proponents say a nuclear-powered future is our best hope of dealing with climate change. And back and forth and back and forth. It's enough to give anyone whiplash just reading about it. Uh, It truly is. I mean, people can judge for themselves whether to believe somebody when they're talking about nuclear power by judging how certain they are of themselves. (laughs) Because because it, it is not black and white. And there are a lot of factors to weigh on both sides of the argument. We've covered a fair number of them over the course of this season, but John and I are going to do a quick recap here. Well, on the pro side of nuclear power, if once a power plant is built, and as long as it's run safely, the power is essentially carbon free. There are no emissions. Nuclear reactors generate electricity without all of the nasty stuff like sulfur dioxide. Not to mention they don't pump out greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, which pollute the air and damage the atmosphere. You know, with, a, say, a coal power plant, you get not only carbon dioxide, which is bad for climate change, but you get all sorts of other pollution. Including radiation, as you may recall from episode six. So plus one for nuclear. It is continuous. They operate for long periods of time between fueling. Nuclear plants only need new fuel every 18 to 24 months, while coal and gas constantly burn up carbon and expel it into the atmosphere. And uranium far and away produces more energy by weight than coal, oil, or gas. A nuclear reactor also takes up less land than solar and wind farms and can operate anywhere on the globe, regardless of climate and weather patterns. So another point for nuclear. For the communities where a nuclear power plant is located, it's lots of jobs, good paying jobs. Yet another mark in the plus column. With the exception of these very rare accidents that draw so much attention, they're in some ways safer than, say, a coal-fired power plant because particulates and whatever that a coal-fired power plant put out have killed a lot of people. I mean, give a lot of people lung disease. Ten years ago, a paper by NASA scientists made the claim that between 1971 and 2009, we'd saved 1.8 million lives by replacing fossil fuel sources with nuclear. They also stated that the number of deaths caused by nuclear power, even if we assumed the highest possible body count, was considerably lower than the number of lives saved by it. So score another point for nuclear. So that's sort of the pro side of nuclear power. The anti is that they're really, really expensive. Cost overruns takes way longer to build it than was expected. All sorts of problems. And this has been such a recurring factor of nuclear power in the United States that it's just that they're not being financed. The average nuclear plant built after 1970 has been 241% more expensive than their original budgets. And that's just considering the building costs. Accidents, although rare, are also extremely costly. There haven't been that many accidents, but the accidents that have happened, the major ones, are really horribly expensive. Hundreds of billions of dollars, you know, uh, in Fukushima. Money that communities may not want to risk. And that brings up another big negative for nuclear, because accidents cost not only money, but lives. You know, at least thousands of people killed, probably way more than that, but minimum thousands killed in Chernobyl. About 60 people died as a direct result of the Chernobyl incident. It's been harder to know how many people died from long-term radiation exposure. As we learned in an earlier episode, you can't know for certain if it's exposure to radiation from something like Chernobyl 
or from something completely different. So there is a huge range of estimated deaths. The World Health Organization puts the number around 4,000, while two radiation scientists claim it could be as high as 60,000. So there's the accident possibility that many people think is unavoidable, that every so often a nuclear power plant will have a major accident that will have catastrophic results. Regardless of the nuclear industry's safety record, Chernobyl is seared in people's minds as a cautionary tale. And that was an accident. What if something deliberate happens? I don't think anyone anticipated the Russian military would seize Chernobyl or shell Ukraine's nuclear power plants in 2022. How do you take something like that into account? It certainly raises questions about our ability to be responsible around this stuff. And there's the waste problem. There's at least a reasonable question as to whether humanity has figured out how to do this, how to do anything that lasts, say, 10,000 or 100,000 years. I mean, civilization hasn't lasted that long. So those, those are the main negatives. By my count, that's four negatives and four positives, kind of leaving us where we started. Which brings me back to John's earlier point, that you have to deal with the world the way it is. And he's not sure nuclear energy has a way forward, especially when there are so many entrenched opinions about it. I agree with some of the pro-nuclear people's point of view that the fears of radiation are often exaggerated, overblown, fueled by ignorance. But those fears exist, <laughs> and you can't just snap your fingers and make them go away. And then, of course, it's something of a political issue. And while it would be nice to remove politics from the equation, actually from a lot of equations, that's not the world we live in. Politics is a real thing. For instance, it's against the law to build a nuclear power plant in California until the federal government gets a used fuel repository. So until that's built, and it's been, you know, it's decades and decades, and there's still not any real plan for having one, there will never be another nuclear power plant in California because it's against the law. And that law was passed because politically, nuclear is like kryptonite in California. California is just one of many. Twelve other states have restrictions on nuclear facilities. Minnesota has an outright ban. End stop. Given all that, John personally doesn't see nuclear energy making a big comeback. At least, not in the U.S. I mean, you have no, no idea how many times the American nuclear renaissance has been announced. As I often tell people, it's different in different countries with different needs. But I don't actually see nuclear power coming back in a significant way in the United States. I've spent a lot of this podcast weighing the pros and cons of nuclear energy, listening to both sides of the debate. Should we use nuclear energy or shouldn't we? But what if that is the wrong question? What if it's not should we or shouldn't we? What if it's will we or won't we? I put that question to Ted Nordhaus, the founder of the Breakthrough Institute. There are lots and lots and lots and lots of things in this country that we obviously should do and we don't do and maybe probably won't do. I hope nuclear is not one of them. But there are so many things that are kind of sclerotic, polarized, dysfunctional political system can't manage to do. For a long time. It's looked like nuclear power may not have much of a future in the U.S., despite all of our futuristic dreams. The number of existing plants was shrinking. New plants aren't coming online fast enough to replace them. And the next generation of reactors will be slow to arrive, if they ever do. Until you get it up and running, nuclear energy is costly in both time and money. And, says Ted Nordhaus, many of the people in charge of these decisions just don't like nuclear energy. You know, we have this sort of legacy anti-nuclear, you know, sort of institutional and sort of ideological anti-nuclear position. But like a lot of these people just, they're old and they need to die. And like, I, I don't wish ill upon them at all, but you know, we just know, you know, what is the, um, I think it was science advances one funeral at a time. A good number of the officials running our current nuclear energy policies grew up during the height of the Cold War 
They experienced firsthand some of the big problems with and fears about nuclear power. And the events in Ukraine likely reawakened some of those worries. But the world has changed and technology has progressed. And now climate change poses as big a threat as nuclear annihilation ever did. As Ted points out, it may be time to reconsider our feelings on nuclear energy. Take a sort of risk that a lot of people actually get really scared about, but that we do anyway, aviation. If we had had the equivalent of the anti-nuclear movement, fighting tooth and nail at every level to make aviation more difficult, more costly, less tolerant of any risk at all, well, we wouldn't have modern aviation. No way. And the tide may be shifting. In April of 2022, as I put the final touches on this season, the Biden administration announced it would launch a $6 billion effort to save nuclear power plants that were slated for closure. Nuclear power contributes more than half of America's carbon-free electricity, so keeping them open means relying less on fossil fuels. It also helps America maintain energy independence, so it won't have to do as much business with foreign countries like Russia. The federal government is also actively seeking volunteer communities to take spent fuel and other nuclear waste and plans to compensate them for doing so. Public opinion appears to be shifting, at least for now. However, as John Mecklen pointed out, there have been past attempts at a nuclear renaissance. There are no guarantees that this one will be any different or that public opinion and political will won't reverse their direction if there's another accident. Part of moving forward, of advancing as a civilization, is taking risks. And I fully get how terrifying that can be, and also see the ways in which it can go horribly wrong. After all, what happened at the SL-1 reactor came at a moment when we were also trying to advance civilization. And the question remains of whether we're any better at this than we were. I like to think so. I found the scientists I spoke with both thoughtful and serious. They're trying to build reactors that are safer, better and more effective while keeping the potential problems with waste, with accidents in mind. And while I don't think nuclear power is on track to be all of America's future, it's a distinct possibility that it will be in the cards for some communities, places where people are willing to take some risks and push ahead with that long-held idea of a nuclear future. The thing that more than anything will sort of change a lot of perspectives and minds on nuclear energy is that you get some first-of-a-kind plants that get built and like kind of do a bunch of the things that people have said they could do and they look different and they're operating at a very different scale than sort of your grandparents' nuclear energy. And I think if we can get to that place, it's going to change a lot of hearts and minds. If all goes according to plan, we could see that happen in Idaho Falls, a place where a deadly accident once changed the course of nuclear history could end up being a place that proves nuclear's future. If you enjoyed this season of Wild Thing, please leave us a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, definitely tell your friends because it really helps get the word out about the show and makes another season more likely. For more information about the show, check out the website, wildthingpodcast.com. That's wildthingpodcast, all one word. This podcast is a production of Foxtopus, Inc., with generous support from First Light Capital. Wild Thing is edited by Alicia Lincoln, with sound mixing and music from Louis Weeks. And our executive producer is Scott Carney. In addition to the names you heard above, I want to extend my thanks to people who generously shared their time, knowledge, and resources, including Sarah Newman, Jorge Perez Gallegos, the University of Colorado Boulder's Nest Studio for the Arts, Neil Cornsey, Tim Tackle, Jeff Berenwald, Kelsey Ray, Marcelo Lessa, and Elias Rojas. Special thanks to all the people whose voices you heard in this podcast, and the many more that you didn't, but whose contributions helped make this story better.